for, for Sarah and Josh and for uh, what they're doing over in Zambia, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, um, for, for just their witness and for how even in the midst of COVID, Lord, that they saw blessings, um, blessings in the lives of prostitutes, people who, you know, others probably have discounted and tossed aside. Uh, Lord, I just ask that you um, just just bless their ministry, Lord. It's 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 hard being over that far away from us, Lord. And uh, I, I've known Sarah since she was eleven or twelve, Lord. And uh, um, we just just continue to ask for safety and and for your leading and encouragement to them, Lord. Uh, Father, I just ask that you open our hearts and soften our our minds as we uh, study your word again, Lord. As, and just ask that you um, just give me the words to say that and you know, give them a target. In your name, amen. So, today our, our sermon is, you know, it's kind of hard because I haven't really preached in almost three weeks now. So, you know, last week you guys probably got spoiled because I think it was like 20 minutes or so for the sermon. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, I don't know if I'm going to even come close to that. So, but the title of the sermon today is, Why Do Some Christians Behave Like the Unsaved? Um, Uh-oh. Um, but today I want to talk about progress. You know, and, and why do some people act like the unsaved? Well, a lot of cases they act like the unsaved because, very honestly, they're immature. Um... You know, we recently sold our house in Millville, as I, as I praise God, but it's the second house I've ever sold. I don't know if, if you guys have owned more houses than sold, um, but it's the second house we sold, and it wasn't as much because we only were there for two years, and, you know, but when we sold our first house in Kingston, that was something special, and, and if you're parents, you probably have done this, I think you would, if, you know, but we had a, a wall, which is, is, a, is a section of wall, and every kid, you'd mark themselves on the wall right I mean it's something that we always did and you know that was the hardest thing Tracy said I couldn't take the sawzall and cut that piece of the wall out something about load bearing or something <laughs> but but I thought okay so you know but Tracy took a, a piece of tracing paper and she traced it and somewhere we have that tracing paper um, but you know every kid you know when they felt like I've grown dad you know, it might be days in a row, and you know, to mark them in, in their initials, right? Um, Tracy is in mine, and her sister Aunt Jen's names were there too, because it only vertical change; it didn't go horizontal, so that was good. Um, I told them at some point I'll outgrow my hair, and truth be told, it seems to be working. Um, but they would compare themselves to where, well, Billy was the oldest, and where does he stand? And it's like, look, I'm taller than he was at the same age. And, and there, there would be excitement. This was very important to them. But, you know, it got to a point where they stopped growing. Sooner, some sooner rather than others, you know. But the point is that the children expected growth. They just knew it. It was going to happen. Could they force growth by doing anything on their own? No. You, you can't. You might be able to get a kid to grow wider, but you can't make them grow taller without using artificial means. Like chemicals can force growth. Uh, I, I know someone who's, who was a, a premature child, and they gave him growth hormone. And the kid grew up to be normal. And they said, well, you know, his parents are like five foot, and he's six foot. So I'm not sure if that was normal, but that's, that was good. You know, but you know... The other side of the coin is easy. You can retard a child's growth. We see this in undeveloped countries. The things can occur to slow down their growth. Take away a child's meal or nutrients will cause people not to grow as well as they should. Um, today we're going to continue our study of Acts through the book of Corinthians. Um, three weeks ago we looked at two important topics unity in the church and then you know which we looked at why some respond positively to the gospel and why other people don't and both are related and they're related in what we're going to talk about today you see in both cases it comes back to being part of God's flock and those who aren't part of God's flock 
Some want to make it about themselves. They talk about salvation and they say things like, you know, they made a decision for God. They accepted Jesus into their hearts. They said the prayer. But that doesn't really mean anything. People cannot save themselves. It doesn't line up with what Jesus said. In John 6, 44, he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Pretty clear. You can't save yourself. And Jesus is the only one who can save us because in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to me. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's not many ways. Now, while it might be tempting to say, let's talk about election and free will, I don't believe our brains are wired to really understand what election and free will is, or Calvinism and Arminianism. So we won't talk about that. That sometimes ticks people off. I, we had a, a, a young man here who was doing uh, with Bibles and Burgers like years ago. And I said, well, you know, it really doesn't make any, you know, wars were fought over this. Why are we still talking about it? Well, it's really important. And he got, went from being very calm to being extremely animated. So we don't talk about those things because you can't prove either one. Um, so, so with that in mind, there are people who come to church, people who profess to be saved based on what they've done. They look and act like Christians. In many aspects, they know the words to say, you know, it's easy to speak Christianese. They know the words to sing. They give money. They do stuff. But they're not saved. Their belief close enough is good enough. They bear no fruit. And that's how Jesus said we can identify them. They are tares placed in the body by Satan to consume resources, distract and discourage believers, with worldly beliefs and values. And Jesus says, the lack of fruit identifies them. But it's funny, he says, when he says this, he says, it's not our job to remove them. Our job is to basically recognize them and set them aside. God's angels will take them away. Since they had not been called by God, church is something they attend, or church is something they do, not something they're a part of. Um, we had guests come, um, wow, it's, when did they, they were here in June, um, Chris and Terry from San Antonio, and as they were walking out, they looked at the post that said, the church is now leaving the building, and they were like, they just stood there and watched, and they were like, that's so true. Well, for the unsaved, this is the church, and they're part of the building. The building's the church that they come to. These are people who wish to worship God their way. They're like Cain. The Bible says, God told him, you know what I expected. And when God rejected Cain's worship because it didn't line up with what God wanted, and God accepted his brothers, instead of standing corrected, he killed his brother. You see, natural man is not capable of pleasing or even understanding God's ways. Why is that? Well, it's because they lack the Spirit of God. It's funny, when people talk about being saved, they talk about a lot of things. They talk about the free gift of salvation, and it is a free gift to us, but it costs God. They talk about Jesus paying the price for their sins. They talk about forgiveness. They talk about becoming children of God, or that now I can go to heaven. But very rarely do we hear, when I'm saved... I received the Holy Spirit. He took up residence in me. Paul talks about it. He's excited about it. In fact, it's that Holy Spirit that's inside of us that's going to raise us up in the dead because it's the same Spirit that's in us that was in Christ. And that Spirit unlocks some of God's secrets for us. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. As Tim said in Sunday school, as we are flipping through a lot of books, this is like when Bill preaches. We have to keep flipping to new pages. And yes, it is. <laughs> so, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. And I'm going to use the NLT because I found that, especially for this sermon, to be a lot more clear um, than, than the ESV in some regards. Um, it's a thought-for-thought thought 
translation as opposed to a word-for-word -word translation. Um, so 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except the person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirits. And we have received God's spirits, spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. You have to have God's spirit in order to know God but also to have access to the wonderful things that God has intended for us. So without the Spirit of God in them, the natural man does not need, feel a need to completely follow Jesus. They can look at Jesus as a good teacher and say, that's close enough. Or they can say there are many ways to come to, G to God. Um, George Harrison, who was a guitarist for a group called the Beatles, was a very religious person, but he was very Eastern religious. And they asked him if he believed in Jesus. He goes, oh yeah, Jesus is one of the ways to heaven. One of. No, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Um, but see, when you're a natural man, you don't have to completely follow him. He can be a teacher that you can pick and choose from. And the reason for this attitude is in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul writes, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. A natural man, the unsaved man, cannot accept the things of God. Just cannot. I, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, actually a couple of months ago now, that I have a woman, a, a friend, my Indian daughter, I call her. Uh, she's uh, sick from Punjab. And, you know, when I told her about the gospel and you know, Jesus died for our sins and three days later rose from the dead. People don't rise from the dead. And she literally laughed. I, I've never heard someone give, present the gospel and hear someone laugh at it. But for her, it was unbelievable. People don't do that. It's nonsense to them. Or folly, as it says. And so Paul says they literally can't understand it. Even things as elemental as the gospel are nonsense to a natural man. And that's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 18-25. We won't go there. Um, but he concludes by saying, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, the problem with the unsaved is they see everything through their eyes. Everything is through their eyes. And if, if I was God... I would do it this way. Well, but you're not God, and it's not even a, it's like an amoeba saying, if I was a man, I would do this. What would an amoeba think? Well, that's a good comparison. Actually, it's probably we're less than an amoeba. But, and because the things of God are foolish to them, when they try to do Christianity their way, they just simply walk us on the broad path, claiming to be on a narrow path. People who really believe they are pleasing God. The unsaved who go to church really think they're doing the right thing. But they subvert the word of what God says. They compromise His word to make it more palatable. More palatable to natural men. We're going to be seeker friendly. They use the values of this word as their guide to success. We need more people. We need to grow the church. But see, that goes back to original sin. The sin was disobedience because they believed the lie that they could be like God. Who grows the church? God brings the people. God brings the people in. Now, you can artificially increase that by, you know, if I said, Claremont Bible Church is going to give $100 out to everyone who comes to church on Sunday, I bet you would have a lot of people in this church. But would that be believers? See, there's some people who believe they're Christians because they go to church. I tell them to avoid their garage because then they'll become a car. So, and like people who pump chemicals into their body, it's artificial. It may look like growth, but it's not the way it should be. Uh, and Jesus spoke of people who tried to do things their way. Just like Cain, it, it doesn't work. Back in Jesus' day, the way things would, the rich would have a wedding, 
you know, it was, it was very, because they didn't have any refrigeration, they'd send out two invitations. The first invitation was, hey, like a save the date. Like we just got one for my nephew. Save the date. We're somewhere in Philadelphia. We're supposed to go September or something like that. So we have to save the date. And then a month or two later, we got, okay, here's the date. Pick what you want to eat. You know, well, back then, it was because there's no refrigeration. We need to know how many people are coming. So let's move over to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, starting in verse 1. So remember how that wedding took place. So in verse 1 it says, Jesus also told them the other parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify who were invited? Now, again, remember, they already got the first invitation. Had they declined at that point, it would have been okay. But apparently, they didn't. But they all refused to come. So this was a great insult, because all this food is, is prepared. So he sent other servants to tell them, The feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. See, these people seem to be the right sort of people. They looked at the part anyways. And in, in um, Luke's account, they give all excuses why they, they couldn't come. But remember, an excuse is a lie wrapped in a reason. So they were the invisual invitees, but they took their position for granted. In verse 5, uh, Matthew records, But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their way, one to his farm, one to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious and sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. The guests made excuses. You see, while they looked the part of being worthy to attend, their hearts betrayed that they were not worthy. The king wiped them out, just as the unsaved are all doomed to judgment and to hell. And now the king who represents God makes a choice. He says in verse 8, And he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of that honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants went out to everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. What a beautiful uh, illustration of redemption. You know, None of us are worthy to be a child of God. Not one of us. You know, he sends his servants out, and as tradition would be, because the focus wasn't supposed to be on the rich people, uh, you know, or the poor people. Everyone was given the same outfit to wear. Yeah, you know, so you'd all look alike. And it may my my uh, friend from India said when they get married, guess what? They have to buy like cloaks for the people so that everyone looks alike. It's kind of funny because like the whole town had to be invited to her, her wedding. And I said, you know, I'd be looking for a very small town to move to. So, um, but she said we had like she had two thousand people at her wedding. I was like, wow, just I couldn't picture this. Um, so, so they'd all looked, and the focus would be on the groom and the bride and 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 for the people who came. But Jesus has an almost side note that a lot of us gloss over in verse 11. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. Friend, he said, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? The man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, Bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called and few are chosen. The king is looking at all the people dressed alike. So if you're standing there in your own clothes and you're not the bride or you're not the groom, you're going to stand out. And the king asks to the man, why? Maybe he had a good reason. And he said nothing. He said not a word. John MacArthur writes this about the man. He says, Until that point, the man had been utterly presumptuous, thinking he could come to the king's feast on his own terms. 
in any clothes that he wanted. He was proud and self-willed, thoughtless of others, and worst of all, insulting to the king. Arrogantly defying royal protocol, he was determined to be himself. Likewise, natural men who do come to church and do church their way are like the man who wished to come to a banquet his way. And like those who outright refused the invitation, this man was judged as a non-believer, as someone not worthy of coming to the feast. Now some may be saying, but pastor, this doesn't seem to be lining up with your title. Remember, what was the title? Oh, come on. Why do the unsaved behave, or why do the saved sometimes act like the unsaved? That's the title, okay? You'll be tested. I had a zot. If someone had it, I would have given you a zot. So, and you've made it clear that natural men and women are not saved. Okay, great. Thank you. But, you know, I had to set the context. Because sometimes Christians act very much like the unsaved. People who are truly born again, but who may say and do things some of these same things that the unsaved do. Yes, there are saved people who may act like worldly people, who may value things that the world values, judge like the world judges, Christians who support very unchristlike politicians, or who say unchristlike things about the authorities that God has put in charge of them. You know, and I, I said every year, every time there's a change of balance in Washington, people switch sides. Oh, he's not my president. Yes, he is. God put him there. And if you talk badly about him, I'm sorry. That's not what. That's sin. So you may ask, well, how is this possible? How can an unsaved person or a saved person act like an unsaved? And that's what we want to just quickly look at. True believers can be divided into two groups of people. Immature or carnal Christians and then spiritual Christians. All believers start off as immature. Newborn babies in Christ. We all start off with the gospel. That all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The, the wages of that sin is death. We can't, an eternity in hell cannot pay our sin debt to God. And no, there are no little sins or big sins. It's all sin. I once had someone say to me that, that I mentioned that um, Ted Bundy, according to James Dobson, made a profession of faith on death row. And it's a serial killer, horrible man in life who came to Christ, and someone said to me, you know, I, I don't want to be in a heaven where a serial killer is. What a crazy thing to say. Because the Bible says if you get angry with someone, you're a murderer. You know, so if you drive in New York State, we're all murderers here. So, you know, and, and let, let's just say it, when you go to Pennsylvania, it can get even worse. And so, because, so, so, we all start as immature. Let's go to John 3. John 3. Jesus talking to Nicodemus, um, who was a, a leader of the, of, a, of the synagogue or of the temple. John 3, verses 3 to 8. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? Notice, exclaimed, because this made no sense to him. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assured you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. That's why I like the NLT in that. I think that passage becomes much clearer under that. I will go back and forth between the ESV and that. But we all start out there. The fleshly human side, the spiritual side. <coughs> Jesus said that on our own, we can only produce more humans. If a church is full of, of non-believers, they can't produce Christians. 
They can produce more people looking like Christians unless the Holy Spirit is involved. Jesus says the process of the Holy Spirit producing spiritual things can't be explained because our brains are not wired that way. Our human brains, it's like when people talk blithely about eternity and oh, what it will be like. I once had a pastor who said, you know, I can't wait for my, my uh, glorified body because I can't imagine praising God 24-7. And I'm like, well, there's no 24-7. It's literally all the time. But but how can you not? This is where we're supposed to be learning this stuff. Understand that this life is going to be an eye blink in eternity. And our brains can't just like, what does $30 trillion look like? You know, I can't picture what that is. I can't picture what eternity is. I'd be lying if I said it, what it would be like. Um, so, some say, say uh, maybe saying, but Pastor, wait, whoop. Later, Paul would write, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you're born again, a baby has no past. A baby can only look to the future. You, we could line up one of my kids, my babies, and you know, mark them, you know, whatever, however big our, our kids were, 19 inches, 20, 25 inches, 30. You know, they were big babies. Um, <laughs> So, except Tara. Tara, I could hold. Her head would be here and her feet would be here. She's a preemie. So, and, and that was, I wish we'd gotten some pictures of that. Um, but now she's that high. So, but we're born again. We're new creations, immature infants in Christ. But the old self, it's passed away. But you know what? The memory that we have of our old self is fresh right there when we're born again. We're close enough to that time that we remember the carnality, the worldliness. We remember what the pleasures of sin was like. We remember the worldly values and the standards that we supported. We remember all the things that we've been taught up to that point. What we've learned in school that may not line up with Scripture. But just as a child is not meant to stay a child, you can't stay as an immature Christian. A child grows up the further they age. The less, as you grow up, the less you remember uh, I, what it was like to be a baby. I mean, anyone here remember what it was like to be a baby? You know. Uh, how about, how far back can you remember as a, as a person? Um, I can go back to, I think, five or six. I don't remember what it was like. I do remember a couple of childish answered prayers that God did for me. But I don't remember what my values were. I don't remember what I would think when I got up out of bed. Um, I remember trading a big bedroom with my brother for a tiny little bedroom with a bunk bed and saying, oh, bunk beds are cool, until you realize that you're falling all over each other. Um, I do know that when I, we went to school, we learned the basics. I don't remember what we learned. I remember... A song from my kindergarten years that my teacher told me, first song I ever learned, you know. I remember with pride singing it to my mom and making my dad listen to it ad infinitum um, and him smiling as I sang. You know, there were ten in the bed and the little one said, roll over, roll over. Uh, so they all rolled over, one fell out and nine in the bed. But I won't go on because you're probably bored by that. See, and that's the danger of immaturity. See, some people would go all, all 10 uh, iterations, or they'd start with 99. Um, but kindergarten was where you learned the basics. You learned discipline was introduced. No, you can't throw a block at Timmy's head. You know, but you can't get your whole education in kindergarten. It's the starting place. They taught, though, what our brains could handle. You didn't learn applied physics in kindergarten. It would seem like nonsense. I mean, let's talk about it. When you push down on this table, it's pushing up with the same force. You tell that to a kindergarten, they're going to laugh you right out, out the door because the table doesn't push up because then they'd sit there and go, nah, see, I don't see it. You know, and maybe kindergartners are more wise than we are when we talk about those things. But each year that we're in school, we progress to learn more and more. And a new believer called by God knows the basics. 
Someone once said, well, I'm a new believer. I can't share the gospel. How did you become a believer? Well, I heard the gospel. If it's good enough for you, it's good enough for someone else. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, starting in verse 1, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Remember, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems, but they were still believers. He says, you're still standing firm. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the Scripture said, He was buried and He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. Paul would go on to say this was not a private event. That He'd name names of people who saw the risen Jesus. 500 people at a time. It's like, I got references. If you want to go see, talk to these people, go talk to them. References are available upon request. This is the same place every believer will start, which is an entrance to the narrow path. You cannot be saved if you do not accept the gospel. And while early Christians could go look up the references and say, hey, I heard you saw the risen Jesus. Oh, yeah, I did. I saw him on the mountaintop. I saw this. Today, you can't talk to anyone that's seen the risen Jesus. Though I'm told in the 1040 winds, though, in the Muslim countries where there are no missionaries or few, that young men are having dreams of a man named Jesus and are being saved in those dream, by those dreams. That's, that's just because we've, not, we've abandoned that section of the world. And God, Jesus would talk to t- t- uh, t- Thomas, I'm sorry, would talk to Thomas. Remember, he, he, he wasn't there that first time that Jesus came. And Tom was like, oh, until I put my hands on his side or into the holes in his hand, I'm not going to believe. And all of a sudden, eight days later, Jesus shows up. And remember what Jesus said? You know, Thomas was like, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Today, unlike then, we have to accept the gospel in faith. Period. We accept it because we've been called by God to His Son. And while we all start out with that basic knowledge, again, we're not supposed to stay there. If we did the post and as our kids just didn't grow up, they stayed 19 or 20 inches long, we'd say there's a problem. We're supposed to grow. And not even physically high. The kids should learn. I mean, how many of you would want to go back to, to kindergarten? I mean, the naps would definitely be nice and the graham crackers and milk also a plus but but really who wants to go back and spend their whole day learning just the basics over and over again we should desire more and more peter would write in first peter 2 verses 2 to 3 like newborn infants long for the spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you tasted that the lord is good As believers, we should long for that spiritual milk because it helps us grow. That's the start. The gospel is the milk, and we hunger and thirst for it. But after a time, we need more. We need meat to keep growing. You can't stay drinking milk. I don't know if there's such a thing as a milk diet, uh, but being lactose intolerant, I wouldn't live very long. But just as in kindergarten, useful things are taught. We can't stay there. You can't stay in kindergarten for a year. You can't stay an immature believer. You need to grow. And in order to understand more of what God desires of us, we need to grow from there spiritually. Spiritual babies grow into spiritual children, and spiritual children should grow into spiritual adults. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said. Let's go to Hebrews 5, just off to the right. Hebrews 5, verses 11 to 14. (laughs) The writer is saying, there is much more we would like to say to you about this, 
but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You seem, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things, i.e. spiritual kindergarten, about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Here's the sad truth. If you're not progressing on a narrow path, if you're not walking in the narrow path, you're sliding backwards. You have to start all over again, he said. The, verse 14 of Hebrews 5 tells us the danger of immature believers. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. You see, the problem is an immature believer can't determine what is right and what is wrong. Yes, they're still saved. Salvation is not something we do about what we do. It's about what God's done. But there are three big issues with immature believers in the body. First, as we just saw, they're incapable of determining the difference between right and wrong. And right and wrong between God's, from God's perspective. God's perspective never changes. But they may be able to determine right and wrong based on the world's perspective, which changes all the time. What was good 30 years ago, well, okay, let's just say good five years ago, is now considered evil. We see many immature believers in denominations accepting the world's values, the things that the world deems good, while at the same breath rejecting what God's Word says, and they don't have a problem with it. Paul would later write to the church in Ephesus about this danger. In Ephesus 4, starting in verse 11, Ah, let's go to it. Come on. Your fingers were probably getting bored. I was sitting here for two minutes. Ephesians 4. Starting in verse 11. Paul writes, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. I'm a gift. Remember that. <laughs> so, and so is Bill and Bruce. So, but here's the thing, verse 12. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. They will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. The reason God has given you leaders in your churches whether they're evangelists, pastors, or teachers, is to equip us and to mature us. And not just Sunday school or kindergarten level. Not to make us into their image. You know, you definitely don't want little bills running around here. This bill. Uh, you, that, you probably don't want little bills and bruises running around. But I want to strive, we should all be striving to be the image of Christ. As Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. And we can only do that when we're mature in the Lord. We see another problem with immature Christians. Not only can they not tell right from wrong from God's perspective, but immature believers are tossed about by every wind of new teaching, as Paul would continue in verses 14 to 20. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about every wind of a new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Again, an immature child still believes a lot of the things that others tell him. I mean, okay, we don't have any here. So, how many people have ever heard of this big fat man in a red suit that comes down the chimney once a year? You know, kids believe that. Kids believe pretty much anything. I could have told Aiden and Liam pretty much anything, and they probably would have believed it. You know, boy, <laughs> oh, temptation. That's probably why God made me get sick. So, but, but they believe whatever you say. And immature Christians will say, well, God is love. That's true. God is love. So a loving God would never send anyone to hell. Wait, what? 
No, the Bible says it. Yeah, but God is love. Again, taken out of context. You know, a mature believer is like the noble Bereans in the book of Acts, who even though Paul, who would write three quarters of the New Testament, had a, had a list of credentials up the kazoo, they still, when he preached to them, remember what they did? They compared everything he said to what Scripture says. And we need to do likewise. You may be sitting there going, oh, I don't think it's so bad being immature. Well, what does Scripture say? You know, so we have to be careful not to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Um, we, I once taught a membership class uh, as, as many years ago, but you know, they got to the end and this person sat there and goes, so I guess you don't support people joining a church from alternate lifestyles. And I was like, well, what, what does the Bible say? No, 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 I know what the Bible says, but, but you wouldn't support that. And I said, well, what does the Bible say? I, I, I know what the Bible says, but what do you say? I said, well, I say what the Bible says. I guess you don't support women pastors. I said, well, women are, are people who should be honored, but men and women have different roles in the church. And they should, they're they not floor mats, but, but I don't believe that a woman can be a pastor because husband of one wife. Uh, that kind of disqualifies her. Oh, and the person's just like, oh. And you, pro and you keep talking about six days of creation. Um, I said, well, okay. She goes, well, why can't you just believe in evolution? I said, well, the Bible says, and, and you could just see the person start to get very red right in the face. You keep talking about the Bible. It's God's word. I said, the Bible says in Romans 5.12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, Adam sinned brought death. <coughs> so that death spread to everyone. I said, death came as a result of sin. Evolution can't support that because evolution says you need lots of sin, death in order to get to where we are. I said, where did original sin come? I said, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. If you believe in evolution, where did original sin come from? Because I believe it happened in the garden and that's where death happened. The person looked at me without even missing a beat. That's just a mystery of the gospel, of the, of the Bible. I was like, then... If, if you don't believe in original sin or you don't believe that we know where sin came from, please tell me, what do you really believe? Um, so, we have to know what God's Word says because otherwise, you just start to accept whatever anyone says and, and it's not, not healthy for the body. And it's not scriptural. Finally, the immature believer, not only are they incapable of determining right or wrong from God's perspective and are tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but immature believers cannot be communicated to in any but the most simplest terms. If you jump back to 1 Corinthians 3, should have done a sword drill. Of course, I'd have my bookmarks. But <clears> 1 <throat> Corinthians 3 verses 1 to the beginning of 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk. There's that milk again, not solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. He's saying, remember, to be called a Corinthian was really kind of a crass thing to say to someone. Today we'd call him a whoremonger. You know, but the Corinth to be called a Corinthian was not a, a good thing. And he's like, I had to talk to you like the world, so I can't even imagine how he talked to them. Um, but he started them on milk, just as every good teacher. Start with the basics. He had to put things in a worldly fashion because they weren't far removed from the world and that kind of thought process. So he put things in that kind of thing. That part was normal for them. They weren't ready for anything stronger, anything deeper. But as I said, babies are not supposed to remain there. And Paul says they weren't ready yet. And now, if you read most commentaries, it says, from the time Paul was there to the time the first letter was sent, it was about five years. So what Paul is saying in five years' time, you should be a mature believer now. I don't think it's a hard and fast rule, but I think 
If you've been a Christian for five years and you're still an immature person, there's a problem. Now, see, they like the Corinthians would like the simple, easy milk. They like interpreting God's ways via their own feelings. Uh, later, Paul would convict them of allowing sin in the body. Remember, there was a guy, and he says, even the pagans don't do what you guys are allowing to happen in your church. I, I, I'm not even there, and I'm saying, kick them out of the body. Now, that's how sin should be dealt with. But it didn't mean that they abandoned him, because in the second letter, which was actually his third letter, or fourth letter, he says, you know, it was a hard thing for him to say, but they restore, he was restored. Sometimes you need to discipline. If you're a kindergarten and you hit someone with a block, I get, well, when I was in school, I don't know what they do now, but you'd sit in a corner. Uh, well, the worst thing was I got put on Mr. Carter's list because I broke a kid's glasses in the first grade. Uh, I was on my permanent record. Anyone have something on their permanent record? And Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, I swear, Mr. Carter was like six foot five, African-American, and from what my dad says, he's the gentlest guy in the world, but I accident, we were playing Buck Buck, and I broke a kid's glasses and then ran away, and I got pulled out of the office, and he goes, this is on your permanent record. I got to see my permanent record. It's not there, so I'm just <laughs> glad. Um, but, but when he was there, they accepted the basics as if, it, as if all that's all it was, and some people do that. Immature believers, that's all we're going to accept is just the, the basics but we're not going to grow. They don't feel a need to. So Paul says, after talking about they weren't ready then, he says in verse 2b, and you still aren't ready. So five years, they weren't ready. For you are still controlled by your own sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with one another. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your own sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I'm a follower of Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? He's pointing to out their worldly behavior. He says, you see, uh, immature believers or carnal believers are indistinguishable. They get jealous, they get into fights, because they're still, remember, they're still so close to being saved because they haven't walked down the path. <coughs> they walked through the narrow gate and just stood there. And said, oh yeah, I can remember when I was at like that. And they accept it as normal. And Paul points out one of their arguments is based on who they follow, whether it's Paul or Apollos, like there's something different. Remember, Apollos is described as an eloquent speaker. Paul says that when he came to him, I determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Paul came and said, I'm just going to share the gospel. <coughs> But he says they were not supposed to be like the world, which chases after different leaders. And now Paul slips them in some godly meat. Maybe it's oatmeal. You know, it's, it's not milk, but it's in verses uh, 5 to 9 of 1 Corinthians 3. He says, after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts. He was there first. Afterwards, Apollos came, and it says, Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. He lays out that Paul and Apollos are just simply workers. You know, we're all just workers. If you're a real believer today, you're just a worker in the field. You're doing the job that you were assigned to, and if, if they did any work outside the will of God, they would just be professionals. It is God who brings the growth. He wants them to recognize that he and Apollos were very different people, but both worked in God's field, period. And again, if you notice, there's a progression, right? One planted, one watered, God brings the growth. And Paul continues to them about being a building. And we'll get into more details of these two illustrations in the next couple of weeks, but another prog progress, progressive movement. 
in verse 10. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay of any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. You know, when you build a house, you have to start with a foundation. And then you build from there. And as Christians, we all start with the same foundation, Jesus Christ, Him crucified. That's what we build on. Before you become a Christian, before you commit your entire life to Him, you recognize that growth is expected. And no, it's not always easy. Let's flip over to Luke 14. Starting in verse 25. You see, some people just want people to say a prayer. They make it flip it. Just say the prayer. I know of, of youth ministries that, that berate kids and tire them out until they say the prayer. They put, bow to peer pressure. No. I know someone who, who, who doesn't come to church because they were pressed to do the prayer. Look at what Jesus says in verse 25 of Luke 14. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you cannot carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's a person who started building and can't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send delegations to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is so far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Now some people say, well, well no one can be rich. You can't be a rich Christian. It's not what Jesus is saying. You got to be willing to. You know, the rich young ruler, he was, bright, was very proud and said, ah, yeah, I, I've obeyed all those laws since my youth. And then Jesus said, well, there's just one more thing. And remember, the man went away grieving, but remember, Jesus looked at him and loved him when he said that. He knew what was going to happen. So Jesus says, count the cost before you become a Christian. Why is this important? Going back to 1 Corinthians 3, because your work's going to be tested. What you do in this life, you may be saved, but your works are going to be tested. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the d judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. And if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss, but the builder will be saved, like, but like someone escaping through a wall of fire. So yes, there will come a time when we're going to go before God, before Christ, not for judgment, because Christ already paid for our sins, but we're going to be rewarded for what you built on that foundation. Is it going to be things of eternal matter? people you shared the gospel with. People will go in and say, well, God, I built you this great church and building. Poof! Wood, hay, and stubble. You know, I, 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 I became a pastor. I was making six figures. You know, but we got a lot of members. I, I had to make some changes. But, poof! All gone. No. It's only the things of eternal consequence that's going to mean anything. So, Conclusion. I bet you a lot of you have been waiting to hear that. Um, we all start as immature. We don't know the books of the Bible. You don't know Zechariah from Zedekiah. And that's okay. You weren't taught that. You know Christ and Him crucified. You know you've been honored to come before be invited into His house to be called. That's our starting point. But we have to grow. We have to be planted Watered, God brings the growth. We plant, build foundations and builds upon them. God does that. 
five years to become a mature. If you've been a Christian for five years and you say, I still don't know the books of the Bible, there's a problem. Well, why do I need to know that? Because how, if I say, go look up Job, where are you going to look? Was that in the New Testament or Old? No, no. You need to know God's Word. You need to study God's Word. And the more you study it, and the more you apply it, when someone comes and says, you know, it goes back to the bank, right? If bank tellers are taught counterfeit bills, not by looking at counterfeit bills, you're taught by looking at real bills. Because once you feel a real dollar bill, you know, I don't know how it would be in the paperless world, but, you know, when you feel a real $100 bill, a $50 bill, and then you feel something that's fake, there's a difference. Today we see many churches and Christians confused by the basics of the gospel. Churches who seem very happy being worldly. They're led by pastors uh, who learn in seminary all the worldly values that you need so many people in order to support this. Or denominations which, you know, we heard of a denomination who they don't tell pastors to weaken the gospel, but what they do is say, well, the number of people you have and an amount of your offering, a percentage of that is your retirement. So if you don't have a lot of people, guess what? You'll never retire. And so they do a sideways kind of thing like that. Seminaries pack a lot of knowledge. I was once asked to do marriage counseling. And the person said, but do you have a degree in counseling? I said, no, I have the Bible, God's Word. Yeah, that, I need more. We need more than just God's Word. If you need more than God's Word, I don't know what you need. So I think you need a Savior. Um... But there are a lot of pastors who like the rulers that Paul would write, were writing about. You know, they, didn't, they did everything, but they liked the hours of being a pastor. My mom, I've shared with you, were in a, their church was interviewing pastors, and there were a lot of pastors who said, well, you know, I work five days a week, nine to five, and I'll give you Sunday mornings for free. I was like, a pastor should be ready 24-7, right? I mean, did, did I miss that, that part? I, I guess I should have gone to seminary. But I'm sure you could call up Bill or Bruce any time, right? So I'll try that tonight. So, um, but, but no, but, but that's what seminaries are teaching. It's, being a pastor is not a job. It's a calling. And as soon as we try to make it into a job, we, we kind of push the Holy Spirit off to the side. Many churches attempt to straddle the line between the world and, and God. Why? Because they're made up of immature believers. They take passages out of context. They discourage people from learning God's Word. Why? Because then they can make the Bible say anything. My mom called me up and I, I, it's a passage in Hebrews, but basically saying, you know, uh, submit to, do whatever your pastor tells you to do. And I was like, there's a passage in the Bible that tells me that? And I'm looking. I said, do you remember the reference? Well, no, they didn't put the reference up. I said, how about books? She gave me Hebrews. And, and there's a passage, but what the guy did is he took one part of a small part of a verse that said, he's responsible for your eternal soul. And it's like, okay, now you put it into context. Now it says something very good. She goes, I said, don't you read the Bible? And she's like, Bill, you know I can't see. I was like, oh, but Dad was there. Well, yeah, but, you know, they put this, this everything up on the thing and we don't have to use the Bible. You know, we, they just put it up there. I was like, but you still need the Bible. See, the problem is churches have become run by immature believers. People focus on what the world values and believes. They ignore, demean God's word. They accept heresies like theistic evolution that puts death before sin. And then when people say, well, but the Bible says this. Oh, yeah, well, the Bible is really a work of man. We can't really, as soon as you distrust what God's word says is the Bible. That it's not inerrant. We, we once, when we first moved to Kingston, 30 some odd years ago, yeah, I think it's 32 years ago, 34 years ago, we went to a local Methodist church. And the guy said something, and I just caught, he was laugh mocking the church, the Bible being inerrant. And I was like, what are you saying? Tracy's like, a jaws dropped, you picked it up, just, he said the Bible's not inerrant. I was like, what? I got the bulletin, requested a message with the pastor or a meeting with the pastor. He showed up. He's like, you can't really believe everything in the Bible, can you? Yes. I said, I don't think I'm going to, we're going to be a good fit for your church. No, I don't think you are either. Um, 
their, my friend Chris, before he was, you know, before I think he was really saved, he went back to, he understood that he needed religion, so he went back to his Catholic church, and I remember, because he, he was really interested, we, we prayed to God for, a, when we first, they moved into an apartment right next to us, and we, we gave grace, and we were thanking God, he goes, you're talking to God like he's really there, he, he was brought up Catholic, I said, because he really is there, he's right here, right with us. So he came back, he's all excited, he goes, I talked to my priest, and he says, you know, Genesis, there's a problem, because that's, man says billions and billions of years, and evolution. He goes, but my priest said, that's all, that's all Hebrew mythology. You don't have to obey Hebrews. I was like, or Genesis. I was like, then where did original sin come from? And he's like, huh, I never asked him that. Thank God Chris is saved, because he's a brain much sharper than mine. So, or, or some people will say you can't listen to Paul. Why? Well, he's a chauvinist. Everyone knows that. Or they're the red-letter Christians, right? Anyone ever hear about red-letter Christians? Yeah, red-letter Christians are people who only believe what Jesus said. But remember what the Bible says. The same spirit that was in Jesus, that raised him, is the one that inspired Paul and Peter. So it's the same spirit. There's, there's no mistakes in the Bible, but see, all these things make sense when you're looking at it from a worldly or natural perspective, not from a spiritual perspective. Why is this all important? Because Jesus said a student is not above his or her teacher. Which means that if your teacher is an immature believer, the stu most students are not going to rise above what he teaches. And so church becomes something you do on Sundays. Maybe Wednesdays for the really spiritual prayer meeting. But for most of us, no, we don't have to. This is important because you need to be able to discern what, who's a saved, well, because a saved person who's an immature believer and a, a tear who's a child of Satan believe a lot of the same things. You can't do anything about the tear except pray for him because you can't save him. But an immature believer, you can fix that. You can teach them. You can start them off. Remember what the guy, guy in Hebrew said. We're going to start you right back to square one. There were nine in the bed. And to go from there. You can encourage them to start moving down the path. No. They have to be humble and recognize their own immaturity. And some people will just dig their heels and I'm not going to... You can't... I know people who say, well, I do enough Bible studies on my own. Why do I need to come to church? I, I don't need anything more. How arrogant. You know, when I, I met Tracy, I wanted to know everything about her, even those crazy aunts and uncles and cousins off to the side. You know, I, I wanted to know everything, and she wanted to know mine until she started to realize that when I said crazy, I... Uh. So, <coughs> but, <coughs> but you want to know everything. If... The creator of the universe died, sent his son to die for you so he can spend eternity for, with you. James says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured, Christ endured the cross. That joy is you and me, the prospect of us spending eternity with him. If the God who created everything in six literal days was willing to suffer in creation for you and I, don't you want to know everything you can about him? Yeah, it starts by looking at creation and saying, wow, look at creation. But then he's giving us his word. And yes, it means that when you have an immature believer, you've got to discipline them. You can't throw blocks during Sunday school class. You need to correct unbiblical behavior. Just as Paul would later do in 1 Corinthians 5. Like Paul, take the time to get him back to basics. Don't leave him there. Don't let him think... And then finally, the biggest one, or one of the biggest, help them to know not only what God's Word says, but to learn how to apply it. Jesus said in John 7, verses 24 to 27, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. 
In other words, if you don't apply it, well, he says in verse 26, but anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come, the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. If you're just learning the words and have the intellectual knowledge, it means nothing, yes. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. You're welcome. Um, notes, huh? 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 Good. So, she's a keeper. So, but you have to not only know what God's Word says, but apply it. There's so many people who know what it says, but it's too hard. That's an immature believer. You must be willing to do this for someone so that they see it's being done. We were at our men's Bible study on Thursday night, and, and Chris was saying that, you know, he was talking to people, and oh, so he was, we went to um, Pedro Island, Padre Island. Padre, um, Padre, he says it's like 60 miles of just beach off of Texas. Um, he says it's wilderness camping. You pack in, you pack out. <coughs> and he said, they bought a camper, and his, friend, his neighbor bought a camper. And he said, this group of people, four or five guys came, and they looked shady. They, they just, they, because with 60 miles of beach, generally you don't sit right next to them. And they set up camp literally right next to them. And he said, the first thing I did is went to one guy, and they wanted to borrow one of their, some of the sand toys because they were going to make a, a sand castle. Uh, he said, and they wound up making this very nice one. But he said, so do you know Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I go to a Baptist church. And then the next guy, he said, started talking to him, and the guy said, nah, it's all that religion stuff. No, I'm not going to worry about it. But that's taking what you've learned and applying it. We are to go out, Jesus' last commands, go out into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It, he doesn't say... Well, if you feel called to witness to someone, no, we are to witness, period. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's someone, someone might say, well, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable. The Lord of the universe hung on a cross naked, beaten to a pulp, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Just as the worst that they're going to do here, at absolute worst, especially in America, be rare. They could kill you. Okay. Then for you to live as Christ, to die is gain. And it's, it's easy to say that because you don't have a gun pointed in your face. But do we want to really cling to this life when we keep saying, I got books, I guess as a country western, everyone wants to talk about heaven, but no one wants to go today. You know, Today, go out and apply it. If you know someone that's an immature believer, take them aside. Start mentoring them. One of the things I think we've lost in, in a lot of Christian circles is this idea of mentoring someone, coming alongside. And it's important to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord. I thank you for, um, for believers. Thank you for the, the people who have taken me aside and mentored me um, who pulled me out from being an immature person for, oh, so long. Um, but I thank you for that. I think of, of men like Casey or Thaddeus, um, people who, who filled the gap for, for my life, Lord, and kept nudging me forward. I thank you, Lord, for, for those people. I thank you, Lord, for that everyone here that's a believer probably has a list uh, of people who've mentored them and, and moved them forward to, didn't want them to be comfortable in their Christianity. Lord, keep, get us so far away from the world in, in what we think and believe and so more far down the, the narrow path that, that when someone says something of the worldly nature that we, we respond with your love but firm in, our, in, in what we believe because your word says it and your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, for the service today. In your name, amen. All right, and our closing hymn is hymn number 512.